<clears throat> every time the pastor is talking about the Old Testament, I'll tune in. And when he starts talking about this Jesus stuff, I'll just kind of go, la, 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 you know. <laughs> but you can't do that, you know. So I started listening to it all. I got a Bible. I started reading it seamlessly from the beginning to the end. And I realized that the Messiah that I had been waiting on was Jesus Christ. So to make a really long story short, a year later, I got saved. I became baptized, and I became on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that hasn't changed all the way through today. So that's my salvation experience, if you will. I do want to thank you for uh, inviting me here. Um, this is kind of my home away from homes. I don't know if you know that, but I've been here a few times. I helped with a couple of the Christmas productions. The biggest help I was was you did not have me sing. And that, that, trust me, that's a big help. Uh, but it's always good to be here. I'm very excited by what God is doing uh, here in Seminole. Um, and I was excited when Scott called me maybe a month ago to ask if I was free today. And I was, but I feel like, Scott, there was some sort of a miscommunication between us. Because I was under the impression you wanted me to kick off like a 26-week series on tithing. Is that not correct? <laughs> All right, so we'll, <laughs> we'll go ahead and talk about something else. But as we get started, I need to ask you guys a question. Is there anybody here from Tennessee? Oh, we have one. Okay, I'm about to tell a true story, but I don't want to offend people from Tennessee, so I'll change it. Is there anybody here from Kentucky? Well, we have Kentucky. All right, we'll keep it as Tennessee, but I promise you this isn't to be offensive to people from Tennessee. Um, about six weeks ago, some dear friends of ours came down to visit. They live in eastern Tennessee. I am originally from New Jersey, and I have known these people from New Jersey like many decades ago. But one day they had to move to eastern Tennessee for their job, and they have a bunch of little kids, and they moved to Tennessee, and they landed there in the middle of the school year. And they were telling us a story about their daughter, Allie, who was entering second grade. I say entering, it was the middle of the school year. She had been in second grade in New Jersey, and now in Tennessee, she was just going to be dropped into the middle of the school year. So the kids went off to school for their first day in Tennessee, and Allie entered her second grade class. And as she got there, the teacher introduced her and then said, well, you're here just in time for a spelling test. <laughs> So Allie was like, oh, this is great. Um, so the teacher said, everybody sit down. I'm going to pass out paper. You've got pens. And I'm going to give you five spelling words. I'll say them. You write them down. Turn them in. The next day, I'll have them graded for you. So Allie got ready. And the teacher said, OK, the first word is frog. And Allie was like, oh, this is easy. You know, I learned that two years ago in New Jersey. Because you know, New Jersey is a little more advanced than Tennessee. <laughs> Well, I see this guy. I don't want to offend you, but I'm going to. I know it. So she says, she's thinking to herself, her brothers, they collect frogs from the pond. She knows how to spell it. And she writes F-R-O-G. And the teacher goes, okay, the next word is tree. And Allie's like, where's the challenge? So she's like, tree. I know how to spell that. She writes T-R-E-E. -E. Then the teacher says, okay, I'm going to give you a two-syllable word. And she says, Apple. Allie got all excited. Again, here she is being dropped in the middle of a second grade class in Tennessee. And she knows how to spell apple. In fact, she had one in her lunch that day, and she knew exactly what to write down. And she wrote A-P-P-L-E. Then the teacher said, here comes the fourth word. It's mountain. Well, they had just moved to eastern Tennessee, and they had seen the signs for the Smoky Mountains National Park. And she'd seen the sign many times already. So she knew how to spell mountain. And she wrote M-O-U-N-T-A-I-N. And she's feeling good. One more word to go. And the teacher goes, okay, the fifth word is heal. And so Allie's thinking a minute, okay, I don't know. I know there's two versions to heal. There's like the heel of our foot, which is spelled H-E-E-L. And then like if we cut our skin, it needs to heal. That's H-E-A-L. I don't know which version of the word she taught them. So she goes, you know what? I'll write both versions on my paper, and maybe I'll get extra credit. So she writes H-E-E-L, she writes H-E-A-L, turns in her paper, feels really good about it, goes home around the family dinner table. The parents are asking all the kids, how was your first day of Tennessee school? 
they get to her and she says, well, great, you sent me there the day that they had a spelling test. Well, what words did you have? So she recounts it for them and they say, I think you got at least 100, maybe you got extra credit. Next day, Allie goes back to school, sits down, the teacher passes out the papers, she gets her paper and she has an 80. And circled around the two spellings of her word heel is a big red X and it says minus 20, really harsh. <laughs> Turns out in Eastern Tennessee, this is how you spell heel, H-I-L-L, heel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, this, these friends of ours from New Jersey, they were in absolute disbelief. I, to me, it was hilarious, but they were in absolute disbelief. Already, they did not blend there, as you can imagine. People from New Jersey, and now I'm offending people from New Jersey, but I be one, we don't blend in a lot of places. They did not blend in Tennessee. They realized they needed to tune their hearing. And that's actually what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about hearing. And so you see this funny word up on the screen here. This is Hebrew. It's the word Shema. And that translates to hear, H-E-A-R. And actually, it's a special form of the word. It's what we call the imperative. All an imperative is is a command. Like, like if I say, hear me, Seminole First Baptist, I just gave you a command for the word hear. And that's what Shema is. It's just a command form of the verb. Turns out in Old Testament scripture, there's a big section of scripture that starts with the word H-E-A-R. It's God talking to the Jewish people through Moses, and he's saying, hear what I'm about to say. Of course, the Old Testament was not originally written in English. You guys know that, right? I just want to make sure. Okay. It was written in Hebrew. So it didn't say hear dot dot dot, it said Shema. And it's again, it's God talking to the Jewish people, giving them a command through Moses. So as you can imagine, the Jewish people took this section of scripture very seriously. They paid a lot of respect to it. They even nicknamed it the Shema. That's how it's affectionately known. Jewish people who are religious will recite this whole section of verses, the Shema, two times a day. Every time they're at the synagogue, it is recited as well. Even at weddings, it's recited. And so the Shema, with these commands, is very, very important to the Jewish people. Now, you're probably sitting here thinking, okay, this was written 3,500 years ago. Here it is, 2024. I'm a Christian. I'm not Jewish. Who cares? <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, hang in there a minute, but by the end, you're going to see why you should care. And it's because Jesus Christ cared. He cared so much. He said, these are some of the most important verses for all of us as believers. So that's kind of where we're headed on this. Before we get to it, first I'm going to take a drink of water. It's diet water because I don't want to gain too much weight. Okay, so this word Shema actually has a lot of depth to it. I don't know if you know other languages, but oftentimes in English we'll say this is what the word means, uh, but if you look at it in another language, it has an incredible depth to it. It means so much more. For example, if I said to you the word here, H-E-A-R, in English it definitely means like sound waves penetrating and vibrating our eardrums. That's what hearing is all about. In Hebrew, the word for here is Shema, and it means so much more than that. It literally means, yep, uh, sound waves are going to vibrate your eardrums, but you need to act on it and obey it. It needs to move from your ears up into your brains where you process it. Then it needs to settle down into your heart. And then it needs to become part of your soul. And it becomes part of the way you are and the way you live your life. Can you see the difference in the depth of meaning? Here in Hebrew, which is Shema, has so much more depth. So we'll put this on the screen, and here's your definition for the word. Shema in scripture is a call to action. I think we're going to put it on the screen. Uh, and it definitely means that we are here to obey. Okay, so the Shema begins in Deuteronomy, and it's actually scattered over verses in Deuteronomy, and it can be found in the book of Numbers as well. So the first part comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
So I want to dissect these verses for a minute. First of all, it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is a command where God is telling the Jewish people and all those who place faith in him that every fiber and every cell of your body is to be focused on one God and one only, and that is him. I'm talking about Yahweh. I'm talking about Adonai. I'm talking about Elohim. Every word you've ever learned for God. This was radical when God told his people there is only one God and you were to love him. The reason it was radical is because the Jewish people were surrounded by all sorts of other civilizations, and all of them were what we call polytheistic. That just means they worshipped many gods. So here comes God, and he's being radical. He's saying, forget all those. Those are gods with a little g. I am God with a big g, and you're to love me, and there's no other God but me. The Lord is one. Here we are in 2024, and there are still on this planet many religions that worship multiple gods. But before we get really comfortable with ourselves saying, well, we are monotheistic, here we are, we're probably all in agreement, there's one God, we need to be careful because even as Christians, we can slip into a pattern where at times we add in other gods. A few years ago, there was a Christian magazine that did a survey and they presented eight other gods that Christians and churches are willing to admit that they sometimes superimpose before God with a big G. So here's the list in no particular order. The first item on the list was celebrities. People sometimes worship celebrities. I've not seen it personally, but I'm very aware of it, if that makes sense. Uh, the most recent time I saw that was with Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> She was at a football game, and I guess the, the cameras for the game were watching her more than the game. And then people have nicknamed themselves Swifties, and they go crazy every time there's a concert. And yeah, apparently people like worship her. So we have to be careful to have a correct perspective. Remember, God is God. These other people, yep, they're entertainers. There's nothing more to them than that. The second item, again, on this list of what sometimes people get more zealous for than God himself, the second item on that list was sports. Um, actually, Scott and I have gone to, he's, he's been very kind, he invites me sometimes to the Rays games. I've gone to those, I've been to a couple of Buccaneer games, and it's amazing. Now, Scott, you should know, is very cool at these games. He, like, he is amazing. But there's always somebody near us that is screaming, they're ringing the cowbell, they got their faces painted up, they're wearing all the garb, and their zeal and passion for the team looks like this is their religion, okay? And that's what we're talking about here. Sometimes people will literally take sports, and when there's a game on, that becomes their passion, and you wish they brought that to church. Their passion for the sports team is greater than what they have for God himself. So sometimes... Sports can become a god in their lives. Okay, the next item on the list is the internet. And the simple test to see have we made the internet our god is where do we spend more time each day? Do we spend more time watching TikTok or the internet or do we spend time with God himself? That's a question for all of us to just ask ourselves. Another item on the list was ourselves, literally ourselves. Do we put ourselves above everything else? Is it all about us? Do we put ourselves as more important than other people when we run right over them? We, we, we literally just run across them like we're a car going across the highway? Or do we put God first? But a lot of people put themselves first as God in their lives. Another item on the list was politicians. You know, years ago, I think this was in Rome, there was something called emperor worship. You had the emperors in Rome and people literally worshiped them. I know that the, uh, the head of North Korea demands that people worship him and bow down to him. And here, even in America, and again, I'm not getting political, but we've had, through every election cycle, some people that just go off the deep end, and they literally worship whoever the politician is that's running for office, and they worship him almost like this is the person that is going to bring salvation to them or not if they lose. And their life goes up and down with, did their person win or did their person lose? Another item on the list that people have made their gods is addictions. It's like, what gets you through your day? 
Is it leaning on the Lord? Or is it leaning on a bottle of alcohol or on drugs or pornography or something else? Again, that's a question we all have to ask ourselves. The seventh item on this list of eight is jobs. So many people wrap their self-worth and self-identity around what they do that it becomes all important. And that's the persona they want to exude to everybody around them. They don't want you looking at them and seeing God. They want you to look at them and see what they do and what they've become. And so their job has taken on such importance, their career is everything. And as a result, that's become a God in their life. Finally, in this survey, there was one more item, and that was money. Some people worship money more than they worship God. And maybe, Scott, this is a good time to start that 26-week series on tithing. I don't know, if, you know. All right, so there's a lot packed into these verses. Uh, I'm going to dissect the next part. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. The takeaway from this is following God is all about love. And I think we can put that on the screen because that's a takeaway I want you all to have. Following God is all about love. Again, uh, not to keep hammering home the year that we live in, but we live in 2024, and at least in English, love has become very superficial. I mean, I throw the word around. I think it was a couple nights ago I said to somebody, man, I love Mexican food, okay? That's not the kind of love that God is seeking here. Where people say they love their cars. Or I don't know if you've ever met people that say, I just love all my friends on Facebook. And then you ask them, how many do you have? 7,281. <laughs> and you're like, oh, do you know them all? I've never met half of them, but I love them. You know, it's a superficial love. It's different than what God is seeking. He wants a love that comes from our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. Not a shallow love. It's the deepest love imaginable. We're to love God with all that we are. So again, these commands that God is giving in the Shema, very, very important to kind of get people on the right track for what our faith in Him should be like. So I said to you that the Shema is kind of scattered in a couple of other places. It continues in Deuteronomy, and then it goes into a book that I know you hang out more than any other book, and that's the book of Numbers. And we'll get to that in a minute. But let's go ahead and look at the next part of the Shema. And this is found in Deuteronomy 11. It's a long section. It goes from 13 to 21. And it says this. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and oil. I'll provide grass in the field for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he'll shut the heavens so that it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce, and you will soon perish from the the good land that the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Listen to this part. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. I'm going to say that again because we're going to get to that in a moment. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Another section I'm going to emphasize. Write them on the door frames of your houses. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. One of the things you should know about the Jewish people is they take these commands where God said, hear me, Shema. They take them very seriously and they take them very literally. The first part that I emphasized in the section we just read was tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. We're going to put a picture up here, and it's a picture of a Jewish uh, religious man wearing something called tefillin. That's the word in Hebrew. The Greek word is phylactery. I don't know if you've ever seen Jewish people wearing this. Anybody ever seen this before? Wow, so nobody. If you notice, there's a cube on his forehead, and there's a cube on his right arm, and then there's leather straps. Every time... 
Jewish religious men are worshiping, they wrap this around. And inside these cubes are scrolls of scripture. It's the Shema that we're talking about today. So I just read you, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. This is the Jewish people doing this literally. They take it very, very seriously. I also just read to you in these verses, write them on the door frames of your homes, right? So we're going to put up another picture. Have you ever seen this, a mezuzah? A couple people nodding. Okay, on Jewish people's houses, you will see this on the entryways to their houses and oftentimes the entryways to all the rooms in there as well. Inside that is a little scroll, again, with the Shema on there. It's a reminder. God is saying, do this so you will remember my commands and think of me as you walk along the way, as you enter your homes, as you're worshiping. Don't let your mind wander. Use your strength to focus on me. And again, this is all embedded in this section where God is saying, hear me, O Israel. And he's teaching them all sorts of commands. This passage has so much. What I just read you has one more thing in it. It has blessings in it. Remember the part I read you about faithfully obey me and then I'll send the rains and you'll have plenty to eat, etc.? If we're obedient, there are blessings that follow. But the whole section of the Shema begins with the premise, first, love the Lord your God. Everything is about love and following God. There's actually a template. If we are just merely obedient to his word because we want his blessings, he can see through that. That's pretty shallow, right? Wouldn't you, if you have children, wouldn't you prefer your children obey you because they love you versus they're obeying you because, okay, they'll get their allowance at the end of the week or whatever? God is the same way. He wants us to obey him because we love him. If we love him the way God says to love him, we will then naturally be propelled to want to obey him. And then blessings will follow. So that's the template here. Loving God comes first. That's a genuine love. Loving him then leads us to want to obey him, and then the blessings will follow. Well, as I said to you, the Shema continues into one more spot. It lands in the book of Numbers. So we're going to put these verses up here. This is from Numbers 15. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments. I'll say it again. Make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You'll have these tassels to look at so you'll remember all the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. All right, once again, I told you the Jewish people, they, are, they take this literally, they take it seriously. I just stressed to you, put tassels on the corners of your garments. Let's go ahead and put up a picture. I don't know if you've ever seen religious men who are Jewish, but if you go to New York City or you go on a trip to Israel with me, you will see a bazillion men walking around with shirts with these white cords with little blue edges on them. Anybody ever seen this before? Okay. These are called tzitzit. And this is the Jewish people honoring and respecting and following through on the commands that God gave them. So what we just read from the Shema in the book of Numbers, this is it being lived out. You know, you have to give the Jewish people a lot of credit. They are very zealous for God. They take him very, very seriously. But wow, they have to follow a lot of commandments. That's tough. A lot of people think that there's 10 commandments, right? I'm sure you've all heard of the 10 commandments. But if you count literally all the commandments in the Old Testament, there are 613 of them. You know how tough it's, it is to follow 10? Am I the only one that has trouble with 10? <laughs> Come on. What kind of church is this? All right, 613. Imagine, but it doesn't stop there. Those 613 are found in the Old Testament, written thousands of years ago. Time has marched on. Cultures have changed. New technology has come in. And it's sometimes tough to look at these commandments and say, well, how does it apply to my situation now in the year that I live? So rabbis have gotten together over the years. And they've looked at this and they said, well, we will issue additional commands and edicts and laws 
that will tell the Jewish people how to apply the Old Testament command to the situation they're in now. So they've written monster books, like commentaries on the Bible, with how to apply the Old Testament commands, and they wind up issuing new commands. If you've ever heard of the Talmud, that's an example of a commentary on the Bible explaining how to apply what God's already said to your situation in the era you live. But as time keeps marching on, the Talmud wasn't enough. So then people wrote the Midrash and the Mishnah, and it goes on and on. There are now mega thousands of laws and commands burdening the Jewish people that they must remember to follow. Can you imagine? It's really, really tough. Again, 10 is tough. Imagine so many thousands. But then Jesus came along. Jesus came along. By the way, I mentioned to you that the Shema was recited two times a day by Jewish people. You know Jesus recited it two times a day. You know he's Jewish, right? Okay. Uh, the reason I check is every now and then I say that to somebody and their jaw drops, their head goes back, their eyes get big, and then like later on they'll pull me aside and go, did you say what I think you said? And I've never heard that before. So I want to make sure you know that Jesus was Jewish. All right, so back to Jesus. He said something very, very profound in Matthew 5, 17, and we'll put that on the screen. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So you don't want to miss this. Jesus never set out to take these thousands of commands and laws and then abolish them. He came to fulfill them and to maintain them but, and this is very important, he brought a new spirit to the law. He realized that the Jewish people were overburdened with thousands and thousands of commandments which they could in no way live out perfectly. So he came up with an encapsulation of the Shema. I call it the Christian Shema because it's found in our New Testament. He kind of rewrote it, and it makes it so much easier to follow. Okay, so we're going to go to Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. And I'm sure you've heard this before. One of the teachers of the law asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And the most important one answer Jesus is this. And now he's reciting the Shema from the Old Testament. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Then he added this. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This is the simplified Shema. This is the simplification of all the thousands of commandments that God wants us to be concerned about. I don't know if you've ever really looked at the commandments in the Old Testament. You can start with the 10, but then start looking at the rest of the 613. And you'll see that all these commandments can land in two buckets. One bucket that you would title love God. The other bucket is love others. You look at all these commands, they're going to land in those two buckets. Meaning, if we just set upon our lives the habit of loving God and loving others, all the commandments take care of themselves. We don't have to walk around as an overburdened people with thousands of commandments that are found in the Old Testament. Because after all, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish them. So we're responsible for them. But if we just simply set our lives on a path where we are loving God and loving others, everything else takes care of itself. So let's go ahead and put the next graphic up. And this is a summation of what Jesus said. This is the Christian Shema, if you will. Love God and love others. It's interesting because you see this all over the place. You'll see it on bumper stickers, on people that are Christians on their cars. You'll see this is the mantra of different churches because they realize the importance of this. Again, Jesus came along. All the laws and commandments we read about in the Old Testament are still important. We're responsible for them. But it boils down to this, love God and love others. It's all about love which I think I said about 15 minutes ago. So let's put this back on the screen. And it says this, following God is about love. Well, not that graphic, but that's okay. Uh, but you might recall I said earlier, following God is about love. So loving God first and loving others second is the message of the Old Testament Shema 
and the New Testament one that Jesus brought us. I don't know how many times you've ever run into people, especially in the secular world, that'll say to you, I'm still trying to find my purpose here on earth. I'm still trying to find meaning to my life. Sometimes if they're like college age, they'll say, I'm going to take a year off from college. I'm going to get a backpack and backpack across Europe and find myself. Anybody ever heard anybody say that? A couple of you? You know, even people in the church, even though we have God's word, there are sometimes people walking around still lost. They're like, I don't know my, re my meaning or my reason for being here. What's God's purpose in my life? This is why the Shema is so important, because it literally answers all of that. We are to love God and love others, because in turn, that brings glory to God. Okay? I'm going to say that again. We love God and we love others, but it doesn't end there. All of that shines a light on God. It brings Him glory. That is our purpose. That is our meaning. That's why we exist. It's to bring God glory. We can put this on the screen, I think. It should be the next graphic, just to reinforce what I just said. Okay, maybe not. These are all out of order. You're challenging me today, I can tell. <laughs> That's okay. Again, the Shema is composed of two parts, loving God and loving others. But we do that, and it's all to help us bring glory to God. That goes counter to how we are wired. Our natural bent when we're not in a faith with Jesus Christ is not to bring glory to anybody else. People that are not wired with a faith toward Christ, the bent is to bring glory to ourselves. We all want to be in the limelight. We want people looking at us. We want people amazed by us. And God says, that's not the way it works. That's not why you're here. That's not why I created you. I created you to love God and love others. And when people see you doing that, they are naturally going to go, wow, you're different than the rest of the world. And then they're going to see me. We love God and love others so that it becomes a giant billboard for who God is. Too many of us, again, think so highly of ourselves. We think that we're here on planet Earth for ourselves. Like everything is about us. us. And everything is about me making sure I have happiness every day. And that's going to be my goal every day to find things that make me happy. It's not our goal. Our goal, I'll keep saying it, is to love God and love others and thus to bring him glory. That reveals our purpose and that gives us meaning in our lives. If there's no other takeaway you get this morning, let the takeaway be that our purpose is to bring glory to God. And we do that by honoring the words of Jesus. Jesus literally reached his arm back into the Old Testament, grabbed the Shema, catapulted it into the New Testament era, which, by the way, we're part of. When he said all that 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just for the audience back then. It was for you and me on July 14th, 2024. So these are very, very important words. And we have to be careful because some of us can say, all right, I commit to... I'll love God, I'll love others. Good, I've done it. It can't be lip service. It's like the definition of the word Shema. It needs to go beyond, in the case of Shema, our ears. It needs to go beyond our lips. It needs to go to our brains and settle into our hearts and settle into our soul and become part of the habit of the way we live. That's what God is looking for. The Shema is actually a pledge of allegiance to God and it's a pledge of allegiance for the way he wants to live out our lives. I'm going to put on the screen, hopefully, one more time. Uh, this is, should be the final graphic, if that helps. Uh, this is the Shema that Jesus gave us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Again, when he said this 2,000 years ago, he had you and me in mind on this very Sunday. I can't think of a better way to honor that and try to follow that than maybe we recite this together. So I'm going to have you guys stand. I know you're comfortable. It's like, oh, we got to stand. Let's do it. And I want you to be like the people that Scott and I see at the ball game. They've got zeal and passion, okay? Do, should I give you a minute to paint your faces? You, I don't so what I want you to do as we recite this, 
Okay, and it starts with Hero Israel. So I'm going to have whoever's controlling this go back a page, if you would. Hopefully you can. And where it says, Hero Israel, no. Nope. <laughs> when we get to it, I want you to substitute in for Israel, Seminole First Baptist. Okay? There we go. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay, so on the count of three, where you see the word Israel, substitute in Seminole First Baptist. One, two, three. Hear, O Seminole First Baptist, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And again, you would have seen the second commandment, which is also to extend this to others, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the message today. The Shema, which maybe you never heard about before, it's an Old Testament phenomenon, was important to Jesus Christ. He recited it twice a day in his life. He took it from the Old Testament. He put it into the New Testament. And he said, these are the greatest commands. So we need to take it very seriously. And so I hope, maybe starting today, that we will all walk a little farther, a little closer to the Lord, walking this path of the commands that he expects us to follow. Why don't you bow your heads with me, and I'll close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Shema. It really does give purpose and meaning to our lives. I thank you that when you created us, you didn't just throw us into this cold world and we had to find our way on our own. You actually give us direction through this. I pray that there are people here today that truly want to see a transition in their lives. They want to see uh, their lives walking closer in step with you. We all need that. And one of the ways is to truly make a habit in our lives of loving you with every cell and every fiber in our bodies and then to extend that love to others around us. We want to do that. We commit to do that. I pray that you bless the efforts this week as people hopefully work on that almost as homework to, to grow closer to you. We ask that you just bless those efforts. And we do it not to bring the limelight on ourselves, but to bring you the full glory that you deserve. We love you and adore you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Alan. As we close